Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar on Citizen Science Ethics 101. I'm Jennifer Shirk. I'm the Interim Executive Director for the Citizen Science Association. And I did want to just briefly give an introduction to the webinar and to our main presenter today before we got started. So Chris Santos Lang, in just a few moments, I will hand this off to him. But a brief thank you to all of you for joining us and a little bit of context as to why and how we're doing a webinar series in general and this webinar series specifically. So the Citizen Science Association is an organization that is cross-cutting and bringing people together from many different contexts to advance the practice of citizen science under many different terms and in many different contexts. And some of our goals to that end are to provide access to tools and resources and to support communication and professional development. And towards these goals, we've launched a series of webinars, many of which are powered by our working groups that are advancing key ideas in this community. So, Chris will give today's first webinar from our ethics working group, uh, which is a citizen science 101. And then we'll also give an introduction to the series that his working group will be leading throughout the year. And I'll let him tell you more about that. But very briefly, working groups, again, are largely self-organized groups that address cross-cutting issues for the field. Um, you can find our working groups on the citizenscience.org website right now, and I would welcome you to take a look at them with the caveat that our website is still feeling some of the impact of a major hack earlier this summer, and so things are not as they should be. But this is an overview of the ethics working group webpage on the site, and you can see that each working group has a space for a blog, for events, to list its members and to catalog some of the resources that they're compiling. Uh, the working groups that we have right now include uh, one on education, one on data and metadata, there's a working group on professional development, and many more. And there is a way to propose new working groups should you be inclined and welcome folks to do that. Another way to engage in cross-cutting issues in the field, uh, I would be remiss to not mention that we have an upcoming conference in March in Raleigh. This is a place where people come together from many different disciplinary contexts and backgrounds to uh, build conversations around issues we all face in our practices. And some of these that are cross-cutting are represented by our working groups, but there are many others. Our call for proposals is still open officially through next Friday and heads up that that will be extended slightly. Uh, so if you're interested in attending and want to get a talk abstract in, please visit this website, citizenscience.org slash sitsci2019. Would love to see folks there. But without further ado, I'd love to get us on towards the content of our webinar for today. Some housekeeping, just very briefly, I've mentioned that audio is off for attendees for this webinar, uh, which is standard for our webinars where we have uh, too many people to accommodate audio and instead rely on the Q&A feature primarily. There's also a chat feature that you can use uh, more informally. So please do utilize those tools. I will be moderating the Q&A um, and compiling questions, which Chris will take at the end of the webinar. So again, our webinar today is on Citizen Science Ethics 101. Um, we're really excited to have Chris and the Ethics Working Group kicking off this series to get us all thinking more about ethical issues in citizen science. Um, I'll just say that CSA does not claim to be an authority in these areas of work. Rather, we're a space to both compile resources and advance conversations about how to make ethical choices when we proceed in our work. Um, and I did want to just mention briefly, there's been a slight change to the format of this webinar today, rather than um, a presentation and panelists, we're focusing more on the presentation and then audience Q&A. That will give us more time to have a focus on the primer and address some of the issues that you all might be facing. 
So without further ado, I am thrilled to hand this off to Chris Santos Lang, co-chair of the Ethics Working Group for CSA. Chris has really mobilized work on uh, behalf of this working group, including to launch this webinar series. And just really excited to have him opening conversations uh, that we can all be thinking more about together in our work. So I will let Chris introduce himself, but thank you in advance to him for uh, leading this conversation and I will let him take it from here. Thanks. Chris. Thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm Chris Santos Lang and I am a co-chair of the Ethics Working Group along with Stacy Lynn. I am also a citizen scientist and I specialize in studying moral psychology. So um, let's see here. I'm going to focus on the on, on our slides here. This is the first in a series of ethics webinars for citizen scientists. But I want you to know that we have a comprehensive set of ethics tools already posted on the CSA website. So you can get started on ethics immediately. You don't have to wait until the other webinars take place. Ethics instruction, which ignored the science of ethics, would present established ethics tools as though they were mystical medicine. And other webinars in this series will teach existing ethics tools, but you are scientists. So we start with a webinar describing their context hoping that the historical perspective will help you to more effectively advance even better tools. This webinar focuses around the questions, what is ethics and how much should I think about ethics? Ethics instruction can easily be abusive because different people are biologically predisposed to be offended in different ways and it's difficult for ethics instructors not to privilege some predispositions over others. This webinar attempts to represent a range of known perspectives, where it lists offensive and legal offenses and legal actions. Please keep in mind that the mere fact that something, someone takes offense at something doesn't necessarily make it wrong, and the mere fact that a behavior is legal doesn't necessarily make it right. Our goal is to provide a broad awareness of controversies likely to arise again and again, so you can anticipate how ethics will be relevant to your own situation. The history conveyed here identifies 10 distinct kinds of ethics tools and eight distinct offenses which motivated their development. The same tools and offenses apply when considering human subjects, animal subjects, and biosafety, and they're likely to remain relevant as we shift attention in the future to topics like robot rights and socio-safety. So then let's get started with the first law. The 19th century brought the rise of hospitals, which in turn brought interest in viewing the insides of bodies prior to actual surgeries. Scientists did that by cutting into live animals, often in demonstrations for large audiences of students. Offended, that animals were suffering pain for the sake of medical education, the Parliament of the United Kingdom established the Cruelty to Animals Act, the first law designed to forbid certain kinds of experiments. The notion of harm has since extended beyond physical pain to include mere risks of pain or damage, and in the case of humans, risks to privacy. Today, some people are so offended by harm that they will not even eat animals or encroach into their habitats. But some other people feel no offense even when torturing and executing human prisoners. Collateral damage. Harm may be necessary in war, but collateral damage is not. Some need collateral damage ever since it empowered the ancients to poison wells. Collateral damage has since become a bottleneck for military strategy. The Hague Convention of 1899 was the first treaty to ban weapons of mass destruction. It specifically banned chemical weapons designed during the American Civil War. However, the treaty was ineffective at preventing either side from using such weapons in World War I. 
we can expect law to be equally ineffective in preventing future research into biological weapons, nuclear weapons, robotic weapons, sonic weapons, cyber weapons, electromagnetic pulse, and social manipulation. Success at minimizing collateral damage has mostly come from limiting war itself by building interdependence. Forms of interdependence have ranged from mutually assured destruction to linked economies. Regulatory agencies. In 1905, Upton Sinclair published The Jungle, a novel which exposed the effects of unbridled capitalism on the meatpacking industry. A year later, the US Congress passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, which aimed to protect consumers from being sold harmful foods or drugs. It established the Food and Drug Administration, a branch of the government which employs scientists to regulate other scientists. Other nations have created similar agencies and other regulatory agencies have been created to mitigate other threats to public health. For example, in 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency was created to mitigate the threats described in Rachel Carlson's book, Silent Spring, which warned about the ecological consequences of industrial scale pesticide use. Control and consent. In World War II, both sides imprisoned conscientious objectors and performed experiments on them. For example, 36 American conscientious objectors became convinced that their duty in the war effort involved starving themselves so that scientists at the University of Minnesota could study starvation. In order to try Nazi scientists for war crimes, judged, co judges co-authored the Nuremberg Code, which prohibits the use of human subjects without upfront agreements documenting informed consent. The Minnesota study would fail modern standards of consent because its subjects consented under threat of shame and incarceration. Like employment contracts, modern upfront agreements also cover issues ranging from intellectual property to liability and dispute resolution. Upfront agreements are one of the best known tools of ethics. Unacceptable ignorance. The FDA had only seven physicians on staff in 1953 when the painkiller thalidomide was first discovered. Six times it, re re it refused to issue a permit for marketing thalidomide, each time requesting further clinical trials. Meanwhile, the drug was marketed in other countries and 20,000 patients were enrolled in clinical trials in the United States. In 1961, the manufacturer took thalidomide off the market because it became known to cause birth defects. It had killed or deformed more than 10,000 children by that time. Congress responded to this tragedy with the Kiedfauer Amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. They imposed new responsibilities on scientists to quickly report all adverse drug reactions to the FDA and to search an archive of such reports before using any drug even for research. That effort has since blossomed into an international database maintained by the World Health Organization to trace every clinical study in the entire world. Reporting is a powerful ethics tool that need not be limited to drug, to drug studies. Eth scientists could warn each other against ways to accidentally damage our environment, accidentally create occupational hazards, empower terrorists, and so forth. Such warnings could be stored in the government-hosted databases already discussed, or they could use emerging technologies such as blockchain and artificial intelligence. Independent review. In 1932, inspired by a study of untreated syphilis in 473 white men, the U.S. Public Health Service collaborated with Tuskegee University to recruit 399 syphilitic black men to observe their untreated syphilis as well. No cure had yet been discovered. The treatment in the study was just a placebo. Nine years into the experiment, penicillin went onto the market as the cure for syphilis. 
But the investigators just kept administering placebo and measuring the inevitable decay and death of their subjects. The investigators reasoned that they caused no harm since their subjects contracted syphilis before being recruited and couldn't afford effective treatment anyway. An expose published in 1972 demonstrated that many American citizens disagreed with that reasoning. Two years later, Congress passed the National Research Act, which introduced institutional review boards, also called IRBs, to provide in investigators with annual independent review of any publicly funded research involving human subjects. The 1971 revision to the Animal Welfare Act and NIH guidelines of the late 1970s introduced two similar types of committees, IACUCs to review research involving animal subjects and IBCs to review research from biosafety perspective. Such committees protect scientists from their own biases by supplying them with independent review, especially soliciting the concerns of non-scientists. Can truth hurt? In 1994, Richard J. Herrnstein and Charles Murray published The Bell Curve, a book which cited IQ test statistics to argue against policies of immigration and affirmative action. Hmm. Immigrants and minorities responded by threatening to boycott participation in future IQ research. The American Psychological Association prevented the boycott by forming a task force of scientists who published the opinion that the evidence was not yet sufficiently conclusive to support the policy recommendations. However, we have yet to develop a long-term solution to the potential of science to support hypotheses contrary to the interests of its subjects. Similar feelings of betrayal may be expected, for example, when data harvested from our social media usage is used to inform political campaign strategies or credit scoring systems, which turn out to be dis disadvantageous for some social media users. Moral harm. In 1996, Dolly, the first mammal cloned from an adult, confirmed the potential to create perfect match transplant organs. One variety on this theme is to grow organs in a human-animal hybrid called a human chimera. Offended by subversive blurring of legal boundaries and degradation of human dignity, Senator Samuel Brownback proposed the Human Chimera Prohibition Act of 2005. It did not pass. In 2017, the Salk Institute in California used CRISPR to create a human pig chimera fetus, then destroyed it. The only effective tool to prevent collateral damage has been what prevents war in the first place. And the only effective tool to prevent subversion may be to make norms so adaptive that they are invulnerable to subversion. Adaptive norms could be dangerous by themselves, however, because any given adaptation could be short-sighted. Evolution benefits from obstacles that isolate ecosystems where older designs can be preserved as backups in case newer adaptations don't work out. Such division between systems is called vicariance. For example, society could manage its vicariance by maintaining physical, legal, or cultural barriers that isolate certain groups of people, enabling some to ban human chimeras while others do not. Intelligent management of our vicariance could make adaptive norms more safe and address the related offense of degradation. Preventing sins of omission. Scientific negligence is a coordination problem in which so many scientists are preoccupied with their own passions that some socially important questions become In the 1980s, society began to test their assumption that scientists were holding each other accountable. This was known as the study of scientific misconduct. Government whistleblowers such as David Graham, David Lapa, David Lewis, Joel Clement, and Bruce Bowler warned against relying on regulatory agencies to prevent negligence. Meanwhile, 
Failures of science were presented to the public via such films as The Insider, Concussion, Challenger, An Inconvenient Truth, and Aaron Brockovich, the last of which documented a $333 million class action, class action lawsuit caused by failure to account for impact on a local water supply. Public outrage flared in 2015 when citizen scientist Leanne Walters exposed professional scientists' similar failure to protect the water supply of Flint, Michigan, resulting in social costs estimated in the billions of dollars. Scientific negligence is sometimes labeled the replication crisis, emphasizing lack of replication studies as a measure of the scientific community's insufficient investment in self-policing. Scientific journals have responded to the crisis by promoting transparency practices. Meanwhile, hoping to fill gaps left by professional scientists, the US Congress promoted citizen science by passing the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act of 2016, which removed obstacles to its public funding and federal courts promoted citizen science by overturning ag-gag laws that would criminalize it. History provides examples of diverse offenses that could get you in trouble, as well as examples of diverse tools you could use to protect, to protect yourself. It also demonstrates growth in public awareness of offenses. The faster social progress moves, the more we can expect policy and norms to lag behind. Already seven of the 10 ethics tools discovered cannot be implemented by government alone. They rely on people like you to take responsibility. Now on to our second question. How much should citizen scientists think about ethics? Recent studies in moral psychology find that different people prioritize different offenses. People who rate themselves as politically liberal are more likely to prioritize harm, whereas people who rate themselves politically libertarian are more likely to prioritize control. And people who rate themselves as politically conservative are more likely to, to prioritize subversion and degradation. In your own ethical decision-making, you could choose to address only offenses important to yourself, or you could choose to address only what existing policies require of you, or you could attempt to avoid offending anyone at all. Which offenses you try to avoid will likely depend on your reasons for thinking about ethics. One reason to think about ethics is to avoid offending yourself. For example, suppose an inventor lost their intellectual property because it was leaked through your citizen science project. You could be offended that someone was harmed, that intellectual property laws were subverted, and that your project was used in ways beyond your control. To prevent offending yourself in these ways, you would need to think about ethics formally to create consent forms that protect intellectual property. There are templates on the CSE CSA ethics website right now that you can use for such purposes. A second reason to think about ethics is to keep your job. The direct legal consequences of violating research laws tend to target institutions rather than specific individuals who misbehave. This encourages institutions to hold employees and affiliates to ethical standards even more strict than the law. Rather than follow merely your own personal ethics, you may also need to read and abide the policies of the institutions with which you affiliate. A third reason to think about ethics is the success of your science. The next webinar in this series will teach stakeholder analysis. For now, realize that the success of your science can depend on decisions made by your stakeholders, including your volunteers, your staff, your boss, your advisors, your funders, your suppliers, your customers, your customers' bosses, your publishers, their readers, your subjects, people whom your research might benefit, people whom your research might restrict, people who will hold you accountable, governments, the families, friends, and church of stakeholders, and so forth. Offending any of these people 
could undermine the success of your science. Rather than rely merely on institutional policies and on your own personal ethics, you may need to involve all relevant stakeholders in your decision-making, at least by considering the ways they might be offended. And there are many other reasons to think about ethics, including reasons specific to, specific to particular religions or schools of philosophy. There are, may even be good reasons no one has yet considered. Citizen scientists noticing that research ethics has historically responded to offense at professional scale science might be tempted to suppose their own work is beyond reproach. We hope that citizen science does have some moral advantages, but we also hope this introduction to our webinar series on ethics has convinced you that even citizen scientists have good reason to think about ethics, and we hope to see you in other webinars of this series. Now I'd like to turn to answering your questions. Chris, thanks for opening that conversation. Um, I am looking at the Q&A in Zoom here, and I don't have any questions queued up just now. So I want to point everyone towards the panel of icons at the bottom of the Zoom screen, where you can choose to use the Q&A feature to enter a question. Um, if that, for some reason, is not working for you, there's also a chat feature where you can enter questions uh, that everyone can see. So please feel free to take advantage of these tools just now. And Chris, while um, we're opening that up for contributed questions, I'll ask a question if I could. Um, since you mentioned that there is opportunity to engage with the working group, both online and at the upcoming conference, you mentioned that there's a, a webinar series. Can you preface for anyone what might be happening at the conference in March related to ethics? I know things are still in review right now, but I'm sure things have been proposed. Sure. Um... One thing we're hoping to do, we'll certainly have uh, opportunities to meet with the ethics working group. We are hoping that we might be able to have a table there that people can come to and talk to us if they have particular things that they uh, have problems with. Um, and we can meet with people and talk with them face to face. Um, we, as I mentioned, have collected a set of uh, tools, resources that are there on our website, which we think address all the kinds of concerns that were raised at the last uh, conference. And uh, we will direct people to those tools and tell them how to use those tools if those address their, your needs. Um, if you have other needs, then uh, we really appreciate hearing about those and so that we can put together tools that will address those needs as well. Or if you have already solved some problems and you have some tools to share with our collection, then uh, we'd appreciate hearing about those and we can add those to the collection and so others can use those too. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, take this opportunity before getting to one question that I see here in the chat to remind everyone that there is this great list of resources on the CSA website that the Ethics Working Group has compiled uh, with the full understanding that these are ethical guidelines and resources. They're not legal advice. Um, these are just a starting point for pointing practitioners in the direction of where to go for further advice should that be needed. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here from Kay Schreier. Uh, what are some of the larger ethical considerations beyond just research related that citizen science may bring up or highlight? What are some of the, what, can you say it again? What was the question? Sure, and actually I think that you should be able to see this if it's helpful, Chris. It's in the chat for all panelists. So Great, I see, okay. I see one in the Q&A as well. Yeah, let's do this one first because right. that one just popped up. But what are some of the larger ethical considerations beyond just research related? Uh, what are some of the, um, 
Yeah, so the, the question here I think is trying to get at what the difference is between citizen science and other kinds of, of science. Or maybe it's also getting at uh, the idea that because citizen science has arisen, we might start seeing some, some new issues that come up. Um, I'll say, um, hmm, I'll give an example. Um, I uh, am the facilitator of a group of citizen scientists, um, which is actually uh, started as a Bible study. Uh, so in this situation, we think a lot about ethics because um, we're thinking about, uh, from a religious standpoint, what we ought to do. And um, we realized that um, citizen science makes science potentially accessible to laypersons much like the translation of the, of the Bible from Latin into common languages made scripture accessible to lay persons. And so we thought maybe we now have an ethical obligation to study science in the same way that we feel we ought to study scripture. And so for two years now, we have been engaging in citizen science um, for the same reasons that we would engage in a Bible study. So churches around the world might also run to the same question. Uh, they may sort of say, hey, maybe we ought to be looking at science in the same way that we look at scripture. That's a, an ethical question that's not really research related. It's really sort of saying, hey, look, science as it becomes more accessible, um, maybe becomes an obligation for us to pay more attention to it. And I see, uh, Added more uh, added to this question, uh, she writes. For instance, knowledge making from the public. How does that? How does that bring up other types of ethics? Okay, so thinking about knowledge making uh, as opposed to knowledge discovery from the public. I'm not sure, and maybe you have some uh, something in mind. It kind of feels like a leading question to me. Do you have something in mind? So I don't know if Kay wants to flesh that out and we can uh, give them the opportunity to do that. I'll say that there are interesting philosophical questions related to knowledge making that might be uh, slightly separate from ethical questions related to what counts as knowledge. Um, so, Kay, thank you for chiming in here to add, and I'm sorry that uh, everyone can't see this, it's coming through to all panelists rather than all attendees, but I'll read out um, that Kay is curious what we're thinking and wrote a book about this, so please, if you would like, um, Okay, go ahead and add uh, in the chat, you, there's a way to chat with all attendees as well. Um, please feel free to add a link to your book. Um, yeah, and, and let's add here, I, I think one point to sort of bring out is that when we use the term citizen science ethics, sometimes in this, in this case for this uh, webinar series, we're talking about um, trying to help citizen scientists access the tools, the ethics tools that they would need. But uh, the term citizen science ethics also refers to questions of, does citizen science raise other interesting ethical questions? Um, and uh, so that's an, an, an interesting topic that you can write an entire book about, I, I think is, is pointing out. Uh, and um, we encourage people to, to investigate those topics as well. Great, Chris. Uh, so hopefully Kay can add uh, a link to, um, to the book that they're mentioning here. There are a few questions in the Q&A, and I'm going to start at the top and go down. Um, Gitta is, is asking, how would you go about getting external review and approval of your citizen science project if you are based at an NGO and don't have access to university review and approval, and if you're located outside of the U.S.? Okay. Um, this is valuable for several reasons. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, tried to point out earlier, um, external review or independent uh, review helps you to uh, deal with your own biases. It helps you to compensate for the potential of bias. 
So, um, so that's one reason that you might want to do this. Another reason you might want to do this, get an external review, is because um, there may be policies like journals will require external review. Um, she's pointed out she's outside the US, so she wouldn't be required by policies um, to use the processes that are used in the IS with IRBs, but there are other types of, of groups that are, uh, that are used in, in other countries. Um, what we did in, in our case, in my, my Bible study group, um, which is now a citizen science group, um, is we were not associated with the university, and so we didn't have a special group of people who would just provide that for us. We needed to build our own ethics review process, and we were assisted by uh, some a bunch of books about the entire process and how you put that together, and also a checklist of what are the important things to do when you're doing that that came from the U.S. government. And uh, that's called citizen uh, the the Belleville Research Ethics Committee is the name of the group that we put together, and we put it together in a way that would make it easy for others to replicate what we're doing, uh, in the sense that they can fork it, um, like like um, like open source software can be forked. So we found it's difficult to find the procedures to create groups. Um, so we made all of our procedures entirely transparent and also you can just click a button there if you want to and build your own group. This isn't helpful just for citizen scientists. It's also helpful for small uh, colleges because smaller colleges may want to do research, but they don't have the resources of a large research institution. And so they also find this helpful to, to use this kind of system. So you're welcome to look at that and build your own. Um, we're not the first citizen science group to sort of put together our own uh, IRB, um, but it's certainly very, uh, something you can do. Um, you can also turn to commercial uh, organizations if you don't have one through your own um, through your university that you're affiliated with. There are commercial IRBs. The expense for that is usually about $1,000, I think, for uh, a given per experiment, per protocol you do. Um, this other approach that, I'm, that we pioneered uh, would be free, uh, except for the volunteer time that you have to spend. But the volunteer time, I think, is worth it because you'll learn a lot about ethics in the process, and it's important that the people who are doing the experiments understand the ethics. Uh, Gita, I'll just add here as well, and thank you for clarifying in the Q&A that you were looking for how to go about getting that kind of review. Um, we have just received news that some folks involved with the ethics working group for the Citizen Science Association have received a grant from the National Science Foundation to start building more intentional tools and resources to enhance what the working group has already done. Um, I don't yet know what's in the pipeline. This is brand new information to us, but I know that something that has been discussed is this real need that you're pointing to right now, um, whether and, and how to go about accessing the same type of IRB review that universities are beholden to um, by law, and many of us want to be beholden to just by ethical standards. So I anticipate that there'll be a lot more conversations about what CSA can start to offer and develop in those regards. Yeah, and you can find those on our website. Uh, in addition, you'll find links on our website if you happen to be uh, links to commercial IRBs um, and uh, links to find out about IRBs and universities that are near you. So you'll find links there to all of those resources, including the ones that are available to people who are in universities. Chris, I'm moving on to a question from um, Jane Disney here, uh, and Jane's asking, um, with some information to back it up, she's wondering how to apply principles of responsible conduct of research to citizen science uh, involving not just the treatment of data, but also um, well, well, I'll just read this. So the treatment of data is one consider consideration. For example, scientists are not allowed to alter photos before publishing. Likewise, citizen scientists should not alter photos before uploading them into citizen science data portals. Mm -hmm. And further clarifies here that the National Academy Press 
um, in their document on being a scientist states that researchers have three sets of obligations. And I think this is furthering her question of whether citizen scientists have similar obligations. And those obligations are one, to honor the trust that their colleagues place in them, two, an obligation to themselves, and three, an obligation to act in ways that serve the public. Mm -hmm. And should these apply to citizen science project managers and or participants as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's one of the interesting questions I've, that's been raised is should citizen scientists be held to the same standards? And um, my impression is that a lot of citizen scientists want to be held to the same standards. Um, a lot of times people want to be ethical. Um, and if people do something that's unethical or that, um, that is, uh, people feel is kind of shady, um, they're very much vulnerable to someone else saying, hey, wait a minute, what you're doing is, is really wrong. Because um, they often have volunteers, right? There's volunteers in uh, citizen science groups. And volunteers generally, I find, don't like to be involved in something that people are saying is shady. So, um, so I think you'll find that citizen scientists, if they have access to the tools, will want to do those same uh, things. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to, to get the access to the tools to everyone. So Jane, thank you for that, for that question and also for the resource. I'm adding a link to that resource in the um, chat window. Uh, it is available for a free download. If you go to that page, it looks like it's going to want you to pay, but then over on the side, there's a free download available. Um, M. Albert is asking, should we be concerned about ethical considerations regarding working with educational groups for collecting data, given that students may not be independently choosing to participate? That's a question about consent. Um, and I think any concerns that anyone has should be considered. That would be my, would be my answer to the, to the direct questions. Um, that's definitely the kind of question that would typically come up in an independent review um, because there's a kind of a, a checklist in independent review of normal questions and ethical considerations. And that would definitely be one, one of the items that would be on that checklist for sure. Thanks. So far, there are two more questions here. Um, and one, I think, involves a comment. Actually, both of them are pretty comprehensive. So we may further this in the chat. But I'm going to read here from Megan Gregory. Hello, Megan. Um, in my experience, some of the, and this is Megan's experience, mm -hmm. some of the most common ethics violations in doing research in and with communities are the interests of communities not receiving as much weight as academic research questions in designing and carrying out research, and also inequity in distribution of resources, especially compensation of those who work on citizen science projects. Mm -hmm. Her question, are there practical tools or guides to help potential partners, for example, researchers and academic scientists, map out expected outcomes ahead of time to ensure that the interests of communities are met and evaluated and to plan for equitable distribution of resources. Absolutely, definitely. Um, in, uh, in the case of uh, the group that I facilitate, one of the tools we used is a consent or uh, an upfront agreement that's put together by the citizen scientists. Whenever someone joins our citizen science group, they have to sign the same agreement that we all signed. And uh, one of the issues that's dealt with there is how are resources going to be distributed? What are we gonna do with, I mean, if, if we come up with something that's worth a lot of money or something like that, what's gonna happen with that? Or uh, how much money, or will people be receiving money or things like that? Um, and so that can all be laid out upfront and rather than uh, things happening later. So you can avoid uh, some of the potential problems be upfront about things from the beginning. And um, regarding the interest of communities, um, the 
Independent review groups, we think one of the best practices in putting together an independent review group is that that independent review group will represent the general community, not just be a bunch of, um, of scientists uh, who may be disconnected from communities. So for example, uh, some research may be done that involves members of Native American tribes. That's a pretty common situation where people are concerned that the moral sensibilities of the members of the tribes is different from the moral sensibilities of many researchers. They have different religious uh, backgrounds and so forth. Um, and that it's a really good idea if you intend to do research that would impact a Native American community, that you ought to run your research plan past a group of Native Americans to sort of let you know, hey, will this be okay with our group, our, our local uh, group that you're dealing with? Similarly, we would suggest that um, if you're dealing with any local group, um, even if it's not Native American, it'd be great to get people from the general community to be involved in the research review. So I've also just added in the chat that there are a few resources that have newly come to my attention that I would be glad to forward along, um, largely coming out of environmental justice contexts and how uh, community-based organizations have dealt with and set up models for dealing with uh, instances where inequities have been encountered. Um, I don't know that they will fully answer your question, Megan, and certainly these, this is one of the uh, big questions of ethics that I think we all need to be thinking about pretty continually when we're working in context with uh, communities where there is an imbalance in power and uh, resources. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, so far, the last question I see here, although we have time to field others if they're coming up, is from Tristan Pett. Uh, the question from Tristan is um, sometime, and it's incomplete, Tristan, so I'll read what's typed here and then feel free to flesh this out if, uh, if there's more to say. Um, sometimes research questions can change during the course of a project. This raises complications when the project is citizen science. How do you deal with this ethically? For example, if the original project changes focus on what the data collection is addressing, um, the participants might feel betrayed. Or more drastically, if the focus shifts from the participants collecting data on a topic to the research studying the participants themselves. Does consent need to be constantly, and, and that's where I, the question cuts off. Um, so I, I think the question is probably getting at- Constantly updated. Updating consent. Yeah. Um, and these, uh, yes, absolutely. If there's a change in the plan, typically um, the best practice for, um, for ethics and review is that you have a plan and the reviewers review that plan and then you stick by the plan. If you deviate from the plan that was approved, then that kind of undermines um, the approval of the plan. So if you, and but, the reality is when you're doing research, you'll learn things. And so you do want to change your plan. And so you do what they call amendments. And um, IRBs uh, will be reviewing amendments. All, all these review committees can be reviewing amendments as things go by. And one of the big questions that arises with, uh, I know in, in IRBs, because there's a, there's interesting, there's a forum uh, we're members of different IRBs all across the country, all get together to deal with different ethical questions. I'm one of the people who, who watches that forum. It's really interesting to see the, the range of different kinds of um, questions that come up. And this is one that comes up uh, pretty regularly is the questions of how do we know when we're uh, reviewing at too deep of a level? We're reviewing every single little amendment and they, they try to make sure that you get full ethical review when it's necessary, but when there's small little amendments that don't really require full uh, review, that uh, you don't burden the review process because the IRBs are currently uh, just dealing with tremendous amount of research to review. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's one of the big questions. Also issues about whether you can sense 
Um, and that's harder, I think, to update consent than to get a new review because a lot of times the people you got consent from are no longer accessible to get consent from. So it might not really be possible to shift. Um, if you needed to change your consent, you might sort of say, well, sorry, you need to start over with new research subjects for that consent because you might not be able to reach the people who, who originally consented. And um, it might not really be fair to sort of say, well, you've already done the research, you know, that, that kind of pressures people towards giving more consent than they might otherwise give if you had explained the full plan up front. Great, and thanks Tristan for confirming in the chat here that it was the word updated that uh, was cut off at the end of the question. Um, so I don't see any additional questions forthcoming, although I, without a doubt, I'm sure that there are new questions um, arising in all of our minds after hearing all of this. I think that one of the things about ethics is that um, we are going to continually be encountering questions that have um, answers that really require thought and time to be dealing with. And Chris has very bravely put himself on the spot here to be addressing some questions that may not have hard and fast answers, others which do. Um, so Chris, thank you for um, putting yourself in the position to be helping to direct questions towards resources that people can find um, to be helping us all be thinking more deeply about these ethical challenges and frontiers that we can confront. Um, and thank you to all of you on this webinar for um, engaging in this conversation, including sharing additional resources, um, bringing up important questions, and also putting out what you have to offer. I would um, strongly encourage any of you who want to be part of this conversation to consider uh, getting in touch with Chris and with others in the ethics working group um, and uh, a good way to do that and I'll just put in a shameless plug here again a good forum for doing that is to uh, come to the conference in March in Raleigh and hope to see many of you there. Um, so Chris do you want to close us out with any last thing about joining the ethics working group? I think that might be a good yeah. Out uh, some people are not going to be able to come to the conference but uh, we are an open group uh, so uh, you can, uh, we usually have a, a monthly uh, conference call and we also have a listserv that we can do work through in, in a, an email group. So if you go onto our site, you'll see opportunities to, to join uh, our group or to raise issues to our group. We have a, a, a sort of a, a suggestion box, which is just any way that you want to suggest something or raise an issue for our group. Um, and there are other ethics groups like the IRB forum that I mentioned. Um, where you, there's lots of other people who are running into the same questions. And so you can bump your, your questions off of them. And I think that's a really great idea. Don't go trying to do research as though you're in isolation, as though no one else has ever run into the same challenges that you're running into. There's lots of other people who may be running into the same questions or have faced them in the past. And it's interesting to see what their experience is as you move forward instead of, doing, instead of moving forward alone. And the wonderful thing about the ethics working group too is that there is a wide range of people with different experiences and access to resources that comprise yep. that group. And so um, Chris would not be the only uh, mind to be uh, yeah. mining as part of that. It's really a wonderful group where there are lots of different perspectives coming together. So strongly encourage folks to join that if this is an area of interest to you or at least check out the website um, to help further some of the questions that might be coming up following this webinar. So I did put a link to the working group in the chat here um, that you can check out. Again, caveat, the website is not putting its best face forward at the moment and we're working on that. Um, but there's really still some great information there. And thanks again to all of you for joining, to Chris for pulling together this information and opening this conversation um, and to the ethics working group as a whole for the forthcoming series. Really looking forward to hearing more on this topic. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks everyone.